Today reminds us of many exciting events. There is so much of this wonderful feast of God's. It's even hard to put into one sermon. One, uh, this is not a habit I want to get into one service. It's only because of our current conditions. But you try to encapsulate everything in one sermon, it will not get done. Or we could be here for three hours, which is not the plan either. I did start my stopwatch, the most important part of getting up here, besides bringing my Bible. <clears throat> this fourth step in God's perfect plan is the central, pivotal, annual holy day in God's perfect plan. You think about all that it pictures, especially in the past six months, how much we need God and his perfect plan in our lives. This whole world needs God's plan, and they don't know it yet. They will finally realize it, and we long for that day. We see more of that in the, in the millennium and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. But so much of this is we begin the holy days of the seventh month with the Feast of Trumpets. Why or how did we get to this point? I try to always base it off of, we, we don't ever separate them from the other holy days. They all lead up, they need the others in the plan. We think of Passover. We couldn't go anywhere past Passover if it wasn't for Jesus Christ's sacrifice. We need his sacrifice. And just as important as his sacrifice, repentance has to be there or sins are not forgiven. That reminder of sacrifice to pay for our sins, a perfect sacrifice. And so much of Christ's sacrifice goes through the rest of the holy days, even into atonement uh, and other of the festivals, because it's the reminder our sins can be forgiven when we repent. And that reminder of Pentecost of our commitment at baptism that we make and how important it is. The Feast of Unleavened Bread reminds us of our continual need to keep the leaven out sin, to keep sin out of our lives with God's help, to follow him, to live by his ways. We see a lot of that in this day that we look at, some of that overcoming as well. Pentecost, the last one that we kept, the third of this plan of God, this memorial of the first fruits. Remembering God is called a select few at the beginning. It's not a huge harvest for the Pentecost. The first fruits that he's working with each and every one of us in our lives to overcome, to keep drawing close to God and God's Holy Spirit in our life, how important it is. And it leads us to this Feast of Trumpets where there's a lot in it. Again, it's the Feast of Trumpets, plural. There's seven of them. We'll look at briefly some of them but specifically the one we look forward to the most, the last one. We look at Christ's return, uh, this reminder, the first one of the annual festivals that hasn't fully occurred yet, and what this day represents. We're going to look at some of it. Again, it will fall on you to go through and dig into past notes through the years, uh, look up other places. I may mention some verses that we'll briefly mention. But we also think of other things that occurred. Jesus Christ was also very likely born very close to now, if not on the Day of Trumpets. Something's lost in the world because they think it's in the winter months, which couldn't be. The shepherds were out keeping their sheep. Many other things. We'll probably go through a sermon leading up to it next year. I think I went through a few years ago. Good to dust it off and review that reminder again. So we think of... Christ born this time of the year and a time where he will return. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 30. <clears throat> we looked at this a few weeks ago in the sermon. It got me to think this same statement applies just as much to the Feast of Trumpets as it does here in Deuteronomy 30. It does to all of our lives. If you think about what this Feast of Trumpets means, <clears throat> there are two paths. There are two ways that God sets before all of us. Trumpets really comes to the fulfillment of those two questions or those two options. 
Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. These two options are set before every single one of us, and we'll see it even more so at the Feast of Trumpets when it is fully fulfilled. God sets before life and death. These two options that are there, blessing and cursing, God says, choose life. Ultimately, the choice for life is eternal life. What this Feast of Trumpets shows. Today, we'll be reminded of one of the meanings of this day and what we can learn from it. title I've given this message, the Feast of Trumpets, Victory or Defeat. Victory or Defeat. When you look at these two ways set before us, sets before you life and death, can word it the same way of I set before you victory or defeat. We'll see these words later in the New Testament. But this reminder, why we're here that we looked at in the offertory, Numbers 29, verse 1, we looked at a day of blowing of trumpets. <coughs> Leviticus 23, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. This blowing of trumpets, this acclamation of joy or a battle cry. Life or death, victory or defeat. It keeps coming up over and over about this day. This joy or it's a battle cry. These things that will take place. This memorial, this remembrance, something to remember, to have this in our mind, to remind us. Turn back to Deuteronomy 8. She knows we've been going through this Bible study I just love Deuteronomy. There's so much in it. It's one of the most quoted books in the New Testament because there is so much in Deuteronomy. That's the excuse I have for going so slow through it, but it's fun. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 and 2. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, be observing to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember, it's the same remembrance, to remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not, whether you would choose life or you would choose death, whether there would be victory or defeat. We can reword this in verse 2, maybe a little more clearly for our time. We see again in verse 2, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these past six months through what the world is calling this pandemic, which so far it seems not too bad right now, which we can thank God for still real. There's still things that have been taking place. But God has led us these past six months, and he will continue to lead us through the months ahead if we continue to follow his lead. But why? Is that, oh, just so you can have a good life, people see that you're doing well and that you're the ones that I'm working with. Not what it says. He's led us these past six months to humble us and to test us. Usually one of the first things we think of, oh, you know, these things are happening to the world. They need to repent. Do we have room for repentance in us? Have we looked in the past six months of, well, how am I doing? What if we are closer than ever? What if it's right around the corner? How is my relationship with God? How is my prayer life? How has my Bible study been? Am I digging into things more than ever? Or, yeah, this is just a blip. I've got plenty of time to repent later. 
God allowed testing to Israel. God allows testing for us to humble us and to test us, as it says, to know what was in our heart, whether we would keep his commandments or not. To think, well, you know, God's commandments are fine when it's peaceful, but when it's tough and it's difficult, it's not that important to me. God tests our heart to see what is our attitude. How quickly will we cave? Or if we cave, how quickly will we see it and repent? <sighs> Why did I do that? God, help me to be stronger. Help me to keep at it, to not give up. That importance of life or death, victory, or defeat. So much of what these this day of trumpets pictures of this blowing and this remembrance, to remember. It's interesting, this memorial of blowing of trumpets. What were they to remember? One of the first things I think of, you can turn back to Exodus chapter 19. I wonder, there's no verse that says, well, here's exactly what they should remember about it. But here's the first place we see trumpet and ram's horn mentioned. And to some it was a trembling event. And to others, I wonder how excited they were. You know, we don't get to hear from Joshua or Caleb or Moses here. We hear the majority or later in chapter 20, you speak to us, Moses. We're scared to death to hear God speak to us. You speak to us. But I wonder, was Caleb, the Joshua's, Oh, this is awesome. We get to hear God. Look at what his might is. We see their attitude later, but we see here in Exodus chapter 19, <clears throat> the first place we see ram's horn, verse 13. So it goes through these commandments. They weren't to touch this mountain when God descended upon it, nor a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, this is the first place ram's horn is found. It's translated trumpet here, but it's the word for ram's horn in the Hebrew. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Think of this should have been excitement. Wow, we get to come closer. But if they weren't right with God, if they weren't following, what are you going to do? You're going to tremble. You're going, I don't want to hear that. Maybe he's going to point out something I've done wrong. Well, how about you repent and do what God shows? This first place that ram's horn is found here, we see as well, dropping down to verse um, 16. I'm not going to go through all of this. It's an interesting study in verse nine, uh, chapter 19 as it leads into the Ten Commandments given in chapter 20. Verse 16, then it, show, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that the, all the people were in the camp trembling. We have the shofar, the ram's horn here in front, and we have the, one of the a silver trumpet. I'm sure the ones that were in the sanctuary were much more elaborate. Um, but we were playing around with them last night and sounding them. They were not trembling at all. They had a little bit of a... And an, but what would it be to have, hear angels blow it? Uh, you think of this piercing blast. I mean, this one you can have a little bit of a melody out of. You can kind of change it a little, your embouchure. Uh, the ram's horn, you can degrees, you can make it blare a little bit more, but it's more just a piercing blast. And if you really get it to sound... It just bellows through the home. Think about an angel blowing, as we'll see in in Revelation. And this reminder here, as they're approaching Mount Sinai, they're told, don't touch the mountain, it's holy. And when these blow, you're going to know it, and there's thunderings and earthquakes, and this is God's power. You think of, wow, what was it like to be there? We see as well in verse 19, third place the trumpets mentioned here. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, this is no human being blowing it. Louder and louder. You just, you run out of breath. You can try to make that thing pierce for a while, but you got to catch your breath. 
It became louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Think of God appearing to them. They didn't see him. He was in a cloud, wasn't able to be seen. But we think of this piercing blast, these thunderings, lightnings. We see in the chapter 20, verses 18 through 21, that the vast majority were scared. We don't want to have to hear from God. We'd rather hear from you, Moses. And you think, oh, but you'd rather hear it from God. Why do you need a go-between? What if Moses was a great leader, but he wasn't perfect? And the next ones that come in, eventually you get to the time of Judges. What if they don't pass on what God tells them to say? They had the opportunity to hear it firsthand. And it was terrifying to hear and see all that took place. But it was to be a relationship. Ah, think of the power, the might that was there. Trumpets that again is mentioned three times. This blasting that took place. This blowing of the trumpet. See, it's the same one that's mentioned in Joshua 6. Turn over to Joshua 6. This one occurring during the days of unleavened bread. <clears throat> it's another one that's a fun one to read through. When you think of Joshua, I still, I'd, I'd, I'd love to sit down with Joshua and say, what was it like when you first heard all you had to do was walk around Jericho and blow horns and shout and the walls were going to fall flat? Yeah, we all have faith in God, but to hear that for the first time, this is the mightiest city in the entire area. You could ride a chariot around the wall. These were not little thin walls that, well, you know, you get enough reverberation, and yeah, we can make that thing fall. Maybe we just hit it with a chariot and it will fall over. These things were massive, unpenetrable. And God tells you, march around it one every day during unleavened bread, and on that seventh, you're gonna, seventh day, you're going to walk around it seven days, and you're going to blow the horns and shout. Okay, <laughs> I believe you, God, but would you have to see it when it finally took place? And in this instruction, we see here in verse 5, Joshua 6 and verse 5, Then it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, here we see the ram's horn and the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant and set seven priests, bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. The trumpet was what God used to begin and to show what would take place. Why, again, this was during unleavened bread, but we have the symbolism of the trumpet, and again, of the two sides, it said before you life and death. To Israel, this would be great joy and triumph and victory. To Jericho, utter defeat. Same event, same trumpets. Same thing that took place. But which side were you on? Depends on whether you were joyful that day or whether you were in captivity or died. Victory or defeat, two again that mention. We think of even what we looked at in Numbers chapter, well, we didn't go there. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10. So many of these verses, I'm like, well, we could skip it this year. Why? <clears throat> the sanctuary and what they had for these instructions, <clears throat> so much of these trumpets that again remind us what took place. Numbers chapter 10 and verse 2, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, make two silver trumpets. I still haven't saved up and I really don't think I ever will. F keep looking on Amazon every year. This is where I got this thing and like, oh, I get two. It's like, we're not replace. These are not the equivalent of what they had. It's just a prop to look at. Well, kind of similar. They were long and silver. Um, 
This is not silver. This is cheap. Um, as cheap as I'm paying for it. <clears throat> anyway, two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the assembly and for directing the movement of the camps. Think of the nation of Israel as they, millions, at, at least 1.5, 2 million by most estimates, how big they were. You needed, you didn't, hey, it's time to move everyone. And, oh, well, they couldn't hear me in the back. You had the trumpet to let them know. But it was also used for war. So you're either moving or there was an enemy coming. So you had to, all right, well, what's this for? What were the piercings for? What was each mentioned for? So they had the directions that were given there. <clears throat> we see dropping down to verse 8 and eight and 10, 8 through 10, the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets, and these shall be to you as an ordinance or a statute forever throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, here's the oppression, and you start looking at our time now. We look at Satan's world around us. It is the enemy. It's oppressive. When you're trying to follow God's way, it doesn't want you to. It's more popular to go away from God's way. The enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, and you will be remembered. So here we see the remembrance goes to someone else. And you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. God remembers. When he hears the trumpet, Israel was given this command as they were to move and assemble and this reminder as they would go through war. When an enemy was coming at them, they would blow the trumpets. God would hear and save them. Trumpet was, God, we need your help. So let the people know, all right, there's an invasion. So get in place and start getting hunkered down. But the trumpet was also for God to hear and remember them and to save them from it, to save them from the enemy. Verse 10, and in the day of your gladness, keeps coming back to here's the good times, the joyous accounts for blowing it. <clears throat> it is these ones that are mentioned in the day of your gladness in your appointed feast at the beginning of your months. You shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a memorial before you, before your God. A memorial for you, before your God. I am the Lord your God. We see trumpets matches all of these. Specifically in verse 9 and 10, it was used for war. The sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, Jeremiah talks about. You see, it was used for war when enemies were coming in. It was also in the day of your gladness, which is why we're here. One of the reasons for the Feast of Trumpets, the day of your gladness. And in your appointed feasts, again, God's appointed feasts. And at the beginning of your months, if anyone went out last night, if you had a warm coat on, it was got pretty chilly last night. I went out before going to bed and it was pretty dark. I couldn't even see the sliver. I didn't go far because it was getting pretty cold out, but it just makes a note of how dark it is outside. Again, the beginning of the months, that small sliver of the moon that was out, these four fulfilled by the Feast of Trumpets. War, the day of our gladness, and the appointed feast, and the beginning of your months. This feast of trumpets begins that seventh month of God. And all that it pictures in God's plan. God's feast of trumpets is both a solemn day and a time of rejoicing. Which will it be for you? This is the time of Jericho. It was that way for one and another for the other. For God's saints, the true followers of God, it is a time of rejoicing. True victory comes on this day. To those that will not repent and fight against Jesus Christ, they will experience quick and utter defeat. Victory or defeat. 
We think of the trumpets that are mentioned in Revelation. You can turn over there. <clears throat> so much of the Old and New Testament coming together paints the full picture. Revelation chapter 8. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 8, begin in verse 1, <clears throat> this prelude to the seventh seal, which includes all the seven trumpets. Verse 1 of chapter 8, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Think of what was going to take place, maybe some uh, time of being somber. Here's the things that are going to take place. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Think of that sweet incense that comes up before God being compared to that sweet incense. The smell that was, oh, God, just this is beautiful. Those prayer of his saints. This reminder of what will take place with these seven trumpets. Verse 4, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The seven trumpets had not blown yet. They still haven't. I think I mentioned that a year or two ago. I had someone call four or five, maybe ten years ago, and she claimed that she heard one of the trumpets. And I said, well, what took place? Because you read through chapter 8, they're not going to be a trumpet. And you know, Oh, that was a trumpet. Wow. Nothing took place. He said, you might want to go through Revelation. I haven't heard her again. Um, I wasn't worried that she actually heard the trumpets. She wasn't. No, we won't get into that. <clears throat> but these seven trumpets that sound will make the last six months seem like child's play. You see the first one, the vegetation is struck. A third of the vegetation, each of these Numbers should astound us. A third of the vegetation struck. The second trumpet, a third of the seas are struck. And then we see the third, the third trumpet, a third of the water, all the fresh water struck. The fourth, we see the heavens struck, a third. You know, we've had, you know, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. Talk about devastation and blackening out of what the, even the sun produces. We saw very little bit, even if you went out this week and you saw maybe a little bit of a haze, the haze was so far up in the atmosphere that actually came all the way from the west coast and those fires in California. It didn't really affect breathing, and that, but it was so high up, in, high up in the altitude, that's how far and how much it reached. And you think, that was nothing. You could still see a sunny day. What will it be like when a third is struck? And it will take these areas out. This fourth trumpet, and then we see in chapter 9, the fifth trumpet, uh, which begins the three woes. You know, we see chemical and biological weapons. Uh, the locust descending from the bottomless pit. We see the sixth trumpet in chapter 9, verse 16. The angels from the Euphrates, the second woe, where a third of mankind is killed. This takes place after the four horsemen ride, where already you had a fourth die from famine and pestilence and disease. Here we see a third of mankind that are left now dies with the sixth trumpet. We see why, again, it's still on an unrepentant world, God's wrath. We see here in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, uh, you read just briefly as we skim through the first six trumpets, what is the attitude? Verse 20, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues 
did not repent of the works of their hand hands but they should not wor- that they should not worship demons and idols of gold silver brass stone and wood which cannot can neither see nor hear nor walk and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts Verses 20 through 21, we see all of these taking place. Idolatry, worshiping of idols, we'll call them saints, whatever you want to name them. They're still demons. They're not alive. Well, the saints, they think they're praying to aren't alive. The demons are. This idolatry that creeps so vastly into society. Murders, sorceries, sexual immorality, and thefts. We see so much of this, even on a limited scale right now, it will get worse. There is no repentance, no, we need to change. There, No, we've got everything we need. We still have our Christ sitting on his throne in Rome, and we are good to go, and this has to be the false society. An unrepentant world is why God's wrath is there. God's saints are being killed left and right through what takes place before the seven trumps. No repentance. No, God still heard their prayers even up till their dying breath. Still sweet aroma to him to know, hang in there. They will be awakened from their grave and be brought back. And you picture God saying, hang in there. There'll be the time when I'm going to resurrect them back to life. Victory as opposed to defeat. But as we go through this time, even before this, the three and a half years of tribulation, this last year, which seems to be these last seven trumpets that will fulfill this day of the Lord, Isaiah 34, verse 8, is that reference we've gone through most years that mentions that possibly being that year time of that last three and a half years. This day of the Lord of this year of these seven last trumpets that still come on an unrepentant world, a world that doesn't want to turn to God. We'll see many that did repent, did turn back. and turn back to Revelation chapter 7. We see the sealing of Israel. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7, before the trumpet sound, so we see the first six seals in this chapter, first four horsemen, the great tribulation, heavenly signs that have occurred before the seven trumpets. During that time, God will use it as a testing. How will God's people do? Will people repent, turn back? There'll be vast numbers that will repent, which is encouraging. You see here in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. goes through those tribes. We then see a great multitude, verse 9, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Repentance was there. They accepted Christ's sacrifice and their sins were forgiven. With palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before his throne and worshipped God. This reminder of that future events, dropping down to verse 14, this innumerable multitude. And I said to him, sir, you know, says, what are all these things? So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They repented. They were baptized. They accepted Christ's sacrifice and they wanted to start putting leaven out of their life year-round to live without sin, to look 
to God and understand it's only through Christ's sacrifice that their sins can be forgiven. And there is a way that they have to live. Keeping God's laws, keeping his commandments, and they're a joy and a delight. That innumerable multitude that will come out of the great tribulation is a comfort that they will go through. And I don't want to have to go through that time. Talks about a place of safety uh, and other places in Revelation. I hope that uh, I can be there. But if I'm not ready, God has to test me. I'd rather be ready now and be doing what's right now. We think of this reminder that that ceiling, the protection will be there. Some will be protected because they died. They'll be safely in the grave waiting for the resurrection. Others will be protected other ways that God will see fit. This ceiling and protection of them, that they will not go through the agony of the seven last trumpets. Those that even will go through the first six and will not want to repent. They will choose not to follow God. Why again we have the reminder over and over, God's Feast of Trumpets is both a solemn day and a time of rejoicing. It depends on which side you're on. Defeat versus victory, life or death. For God's saints, the elect, the true followers of God, those who repent, it is a time of rejoicing. To even start to hear the sounds of the blast, to hear what will that be like. Even this week I was listening to some very accomplished people who play the trumpets, and I just love hearing that sound of a trumpet. I wonder how much it will make them sound pathetic when you hear the actual sound of this blast of a trumpet. And it doesn't sound like it's going to be a, a, a musical sound. It's going to be this blast that goes out of warning. And each one of these that everyone will have revelation in their Bible, here's those trumpet blasts. To have it before you and to read them and, well, that can't be this one. That can't be that. But God's saints, as they go through, well, we're counting them down. Whether we're in the grave, we're not going to hear them, but we'll hear that last one. But if we're in that place of safety, wherever God chooses, we think of each one of them will sound. What will that excitement be? What will that motivation be? As you think in your life, what motivates you? What's it that you get up for in the morning? What gives you the excitement? Oh, I can hardly wait to get up. What motivates you? God's plan gives hope and motivation to keep enduring, even during the toughest times, to keep enduring. What kind of inheritance do you have ahead of you? What is that hope? This Feast of Trumpets reminds us of it. Turn back to 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> we back to Revelation, but simple place to hold have in mind 1st Corinthians chapter 15 we looked at this two weeks ago but I love these verses this is interesting because these are often ones that I'll read at funerals to remind us of our hope um, you know you read them over and over each time something new usually oh, I hadn't thought about that word I was Sherman's funeral was a few weeks ago, and when I was reading, I didn't have a pen in my pocket, but I'm going through the funeral, and I'm like, oh, I want to look up that word. Where else is that found? This is an important uh, aspect that's here. We see here in verse 50, 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> so much through this whole chapter. We get down to verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Without getting into a whole sermon or two, I think Ed Dowd gave a great series a few months ago on uh, what does it mean to be born again. Well, to be born again, you have to be spirit being to be in God's family. It is not a baptism. It's the beginning portion as you start to go through it. 
But you're not born again until that seventh trump blast and your change incorruptible. That's what the reference is, and we'll see it in other places as well. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. You know, take note, this is missing in the world. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. There's no doubt. We get to the sixth one. Well, I don't know. Will, will there be a seventh one? It will sound. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. This word victory is used three times in three verses in these short eight, nine verses that we'll read here. The first one we see, death is swallowed up in victory. This only applies to those that are changed in a twinkling of an eye. They will never die again. This first resurrection is the spirit life. Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? It's not there anymore for those who've been changed in the twinkling of an eye. Here again, verse 55, the second place we see. O Hades, where is your victory? Grave has no victory anymore. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Here we're reminded, you think about our blessings that we've recounted and thought about before we gave the offering. Hopefully it's something we always think about, and it's usually when you do, you realize, all right, I can't empty out the bank account, but I definitely deserve to give God every single thing I have. And we do at baptism. We commit our life. We bury the old man, and we come up to a new way of life. This reminder of what God has done in our life is all about verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Which side are you on? This day reminds of those that are given the victory from the Father have been given the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Goes back again to Passover. Can't get any further in God's plan without the death of Jesus Christ for your sins. Or we all deserve the death penalty. This victory that is mentioned three times. See in verse 54, verse 55, and verse 57. We'll get back to this word. Let's finish up this section. Verse 57, we went through this a couple years ago. Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So we look forward to that seventh trump, and we long for that seventh trump to sound. It's not just a waiting game. It's not, well, let me just sit back and, what the, not not today, okay, well, we are to be doing something. We see three things specifically mentioned, to be steadfast. This word steadfast means settled, steady. It's used metaphorically in referring to the mind and purpose. Steadfast in mind and purpose. All right, yeah. Troubling events have been occurring the past six months. Are we settled? Are we still looking to the kingdom and his righteousness? The second thing mentioned, we are to be immovable. Means unmovable, firm, set. You think of putting on the armor of God to stand, not to run, but to be immovable. 
immovable ultimately in God's ways. And the third one, always abounding in the work of the Lord. This word abound, abounding means to be in excess, exceed in measure, to superabound, to abound richly, to abound richly in the work of the Lord. Not in the work of the world, or to abound in the work of the Lord. This word for work in the Greek means to labor, the business. We're in the family business. We're in the employment, something to be done, God's work. What is that work that we are to be abounding in? We'll see more of that through this uh, whole rest of the sermon. But the reminder that we have here that we thank God the Father who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This word victory, Strong's number 3534, it's Nikos, N-I-K-O-S. We'll see it in two other versions, different, this is the, I think the adjective. It's used only one other place besides these three places here in 1 Corinthians. So it's used quite a bit. And we see this mention of it <clears throat> three times in, th in these four or five verses, uh, but only one other place. So if that's what kind of interests me when I was going through it in the funeral, I was like, oh, victory. That's never popped out at me the same way. And so I always, I love word searches and going, where is it found? And what else does it have in that meaning? Because the thanks to God, we have to know what it is. What is that victory? This word that's used here, <clears throat> again, is nikos, and it means victoriously, triumphantly. This word, an understanding of triumph. We think of what this word means. We see through verse 50 through 58, it's ultimately that being changed in the twinkling of an eye. Death no longer has anything over us. We can no longer die which will mean a lot, especially if we go through some kind of a death through the Great Tribulation, other times leading up to that. That triumph and victory that only comes from the Father through Jesus Christ. How important this is. The only other place that is found comes from Christ. Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> for this specific word, we'll see other verb and noun versions of it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 12. My God's word is so rich. Christ, oh yeah, well, I guess I should probably use that word one other time before you get to it later in 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> First, uh, Matthew chapter 12. Begin in verse 15. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 15. Here we have the healing on the Sabbath that takes place. They want to kill him because he actually healed. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Verses 9 through 14. This is not talking of a doctor. This is talking of a miracle. There should have been rejoicing. Again, there's two sides. Life and death. The person was healed and you had the other people. Let's kill this guy for healing him. We see it as it then goes into verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, knew they were trying to destroy him, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him. He healed them all, and he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, so now he's going to quote Isaiah. Verse, uh, verse 18, we'll turn to this here in a section. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. Here's God putting his spirit upon my beloved. This reference to Jesus Christ. And he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. Wasn't the time for judgment, but also something else that's mentioned here as well. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice 
to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. This word victory that's used in verse 20 isn't used in Isaiah. Similar word, it's the same word, but it's not translated victory back in Isaiah, and probably should, uh, should be. But here Christ reminds them till he sends forth justice to victory, ultimately already pointing to that seventh trump, that victory that would occur. Turn over to Isaiah where we see this original quote. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. I, I know I say it a lot. I love where things are quoted in the Old Testament and New, and then you read them both, and Christ didn't, oh, I, I, I messed up. I, I didn't quote it perfectly. He quoted it perfectly the way it was to be fulfilled and what its true meaning was. And we think of Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. You see a lot of it already. You think, again, it wasn't a time of judgment. You think of all the great multitudes that followed. He healed every single one of them. He doesn't, well, do you keep the Sabbath? Oh, well, I'm not healing you. Do you? It doesn't mean the Sabbath's not important. It just meant all those anguishing, even the broken reeds, maybe some that weren't fully following. Christ healed every single one of them. It didn't mean, oh, well, good, now you can do whatever you want. It meant he had compassion on everyone, knowing the Father would call them in their time, and when they would look back, they would say, Christ healed me during that. Look, he is the one that is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This broken reed, those hurting, he will not hurt or break. Christ had compassion on all. We think of his return will be a little different. Compassion will be theirs to those who repent, but those who will fight against him will end very quickly. Verse is it still here in verse three? He will bring forth justice for truth. This word truth here in the Hebrews, the same one we see, he will bring forth justice for victory in the New Testament. Victory, truth. God's truth will prevail. God's truth will be done. God's plan will be there. That plan, that ultimate victory. Verse 4, he will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastland shall wait for his law. Think of a prophecy that will be fulfilled ultimately on trumpets. And we think of what Christ mentions in Matthew 12, where he quotes from this exact place in Isaiah 42 and quotes it with the reminder of victory that will be there. A victory that is there for those who choose life. For those who choose death, it isn't there. This victory that is only given from the Father through Jesus Christ. Turn over to 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> we'll see the noun of this. I didn't look up the, the word meaning. It, it's the word, as you look at it in the Greek, Nike, N-I-K-E. I know Nike got theirs from some pagan deity. So I'm not trying to tell you to go buy Nikes. But I find it interesting where this full word for Nike does mean victory. 1 John, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. 1 John 5, <clears throat> too busy talking about Nike. 1 <clears throat> John chapter 5, this is the noun. It's hard to miss my favorite verses in verse 3, but we'll see. 
Now let's read verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We often read this, but what does come after it? This is the love of God. We keep his commandments. They're not a burden. They're a joy. We rejoice at them. It's interesting. Those that look at God's commandments and it's a burden, God set before you life and death. There's two sides. Oh, I have to keep this. It's not what I really want to do. I'd really be doing something else today. Is there victory with that? God's saints look at God's commandments as a joy. Oh, you get to follow God's ways. They're blessings. They're what's truth. Verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, your faith. Think of faith and how precious it is. Even in the pastor's letter, you look at Christ saying, well, the Son of Man returns, will he actually find faith? Those who overcome the world is through faith. Whenever I baptize an individual, we go through, you know, will you feel this presence of God's Holy Spirit just fill you? Will there be something you feel? No, there isn't. What do you have? You have the faith. God promised with baptism and the laying on of hands, he will send his spirit to dwell in you. His power. It's faith that you have. You have the same faith. None of us were ever there when Christ was crucified. But we know by faith the promise was given. It was done. And we have faith. We know that these things took place. They drive us. They give us that courage in our life. That's what Hebrews 11, do what God says. Believing God and doing what he says are the two aspects of what true godly faith is. And those born of God, ultimately, that's mentioned here in verse 4, born at that seventh trump, you're not fully born into the family. It's, you're in the beginning process at baptism, but you're not born into the family of God until that seventh trump and you are changed in a twinkling of an eye. That's when you are truly born into the family of God. You are no longer physical. You will be a spirit being in God's family. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And it is a struggle at times. Usually enter after baptism, oh, I'll never sin again. You know, deep down, that's probably not true because you've seen your parents and, well, they're not perfect. Uh, you see others in the congregation, they're not perfect. But we're all working on it. We're hopefully all overcoming and still working on it. We're not getting into a rut in our life. We're not trying to, well, you know, this is just the way I was born. We're all working at overcoming it's interesting, this word for victory and overcoming are very closely related. This word for overcome that's used here in verse 4, this victory has overcome the world. The first word for victory is 3529. 3529 here in verse 4, the word I mentioned earlier, Nike, N-I-K-E. This word for overcome is also translated as victory in other places. It's overcome is 3528. 3528, Nikao, N I K A O. We see another variation of this word. And it means, this word overcome, to conquer. Also translated victory. It's interesting, when I was looking at both of these words for victory and overcome, where they both brought me to one spot in Revelation. Uh, both of these words are found there. Word for victory and overcoming that we see. Turn over to Revelation chapter 15. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 15. So we read two weeks ago, chapter 11 is where... The seventh trumpet sounds, the beginning of the third woe. Again, the seventh trumpet, it's victory for one group and it's defeat for another. It's life for one, true eternal life, 
and its death to another. And we won't turn back there, but Revelation 11, verses 15 through 19, one of the other reasons I gave that sermon two weeks ago to hit some of those fundamentals of these fall holy days. <clears throat> but that seventh trump sounds, and it brings on the seven bowls. The seventh trump that we often talk about and we can hardly wait for is absolute joy and victory to the saints. And to the others, it doesn't go well. You thought the first six trumpets were devastating. We see this seventh trump and the seven bowls that are poured out. We see here in chapter 15, verse 1, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. It's got to be some comfort to know it's the seven last plagues. There's no more after it. The seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And make, make no mistake that God's wrath is perfectly justified. It's perfectly merciful. It's quick. They will be given the opportunity to repent. They'll be raised to physical life in that second resurrection. But those that will continue to fight and not repent and turn to God, God will send these last seven plagues on the earth. But it's interesting, before they're given, we see verse 2. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast... Make no mistake, the time of the beast will be difficult. And it's probably an understatement. Talks about, maybe after the feast we'll go through some of these verses that talk about what will take place, what we have to be prepared for. Talks about you won't be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast. You won't be able to go and buy or sell. Well, I've got to get it because I've got to have food. There will be those that will stand up for God's way to the very end. And as it says here, <clears throat> those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing the songs of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, we'll get to this song here in a little bit. We think of this victory that's given, this victory that's mentioned, that's the same family of words as you look at what we just looked at in 1 John chapter 5, that also goes back to 1 Corinthians 15. It's the same word, this word victory, the same word that's translated overcome. To overcome is victory. Overcoming doesn't mean, oh, you never slip up again and you never go down that path. Sometimes we do. And we get back up with God's help. We repent. We keep trying to overcome. This victory and overcoming, how closely they are related and how each of the seven church eras, each and every one of them, says to overcome. And things that we're to look at. I've gone through a whole sermon on that. It's been a while. It's a good one to go through in Revelation 2-3. Look at each of the ones of overcome. They're written to all the church eras. It's not, oh, you know, just this church needs to work on this and just this one. But to read through them and, well, am, am I overcoming in this area? Am I working on this? This victory and overcoming, how quick, how closely they are related. Victory has our part in overcoming. Overcoming and coming out of this world. A unified world that will be led by Satan and the beast power will become more and more difficult. Then, maybe not what we want to think about, but probably will make these last six months seem, well, I'd like to go back to that time. But will we still be victorious? Will we still be overcoming during those times as well? 
The trumpet is to be a joyful sound to the saints. It's something, once the trumpet sounds, there's victory for the saints. Why is the seven bowls are poured out? Those that have victory from the Father through Jesus Christ have already been changed in the twinkling of an eye. Your spirit beings at that point. That victory is you're going through the song in the excitement of the seventh trumpet sounded. This is the one we've been waiting for. And you think of all the things we can hardly wait. Can we picture that seventh trump? Not a time that I don't go through trumpets and, oh, who are you looking forward to seeing? We were talking about it again last night. We think of this joyful time. But on the other side of it, to those who choose death, there is defeat. Why, as you look at the Feast of Trumpets, it's victory or defeat. That seventh trump, when it sounds, for those that have victory from the Father through Jesus Christ, Talk about joy. Uh, you think about what will it be like. You think about those with the aches and pains. They never have ache or pain. Uh, there's a member back in our old area who died a number of years ago, Mr. Kepler. He was always crippled from the time I remembered him as a kid. He was on crutches, and I remember times he'd be in the back of the hall. He'd be at church every single week. And I remember seeing him fall on his crutches and him get up with a smile and kept at it. And I remember seeing him as he went down more. It was in a wheelchair. Uh, my girls got to meet him from the time I was a kid all the way till I had kids where they could meet him. Every time I read the verse, it talks about leaping like a deer. I will see Mr. Kepler leap like a deer. I can hardly wait. Can you picture the time? Because the seven last bowls that will be poured out are on, not on the saints. We change in the twinkling of an eye. What will this song be like? It's interesting as we look through this. It's not, oh, and don't forget my woes. Here's how I died. And there's people that have been sawn in half. Isaiah the prophet is mentioned that possibly was killed that way. We know someone was. It's mentioned in Hebrews 11. It's interesting. The song is not, oh, I've gone through so much. Look at me. Look at what all I've done. The focus should be on me. We're the saints now. Look to us. Worship us. What is the song? The seventh trump, the excitement is there. And here we see the song, which I'm sure we can't even fathom how beautiful this will be to think about who you're singing beside. You know, we've gone through those remembering of those who've died in the past years to look forward to those we will see again. You know, I think of, I hate to list names because I, I know I forget people. Even last year when I went through them, I'm like, oh, what about this person? Usually I'm going through my, my uh, funeral um, notes that I've done and writing them down. In the past year since the last Feast of Trumpets, I think of Sharon. I can hardly wait to see Sharon. Sharon Smith, and the times we tried to talk to her, and she had the difficulties of talking, but she always had that smile on her face. I look forward to seeing Sharon when she sees her mom. Uh, you think of those individuals. Does this day have the meaning? Does it give you the excitement? Do you think about what this day means if you are on the victory side? It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not our might. It's not because, wow, we're just so much better. I always go back to 1 Corinthians whenever we start to get a big head. All right, God's not calling the brightest and the kings and priests of the world. He calls the lowly to show them that it's not our might. It's God's might. We think of those individuals, Daryl Waterman. We think of Sherman, just died within the past few weeks. Think of individuals that we will long to see again. Obviously, their spouses can hardly wait for it, brothers and sisters. Seeing those individuals through the years, uh, even when I was at Sherman's, we were just a, maybe a few blocks from where uh, Mr. Price and Mrs. Price used to live. And so I drove by their old place, and I remember going with Mr. Price after Alberta had died, 
and seeing the tombstones. I, I knew where it was, so I went up. Just I, I never go to, obviously we're not talking to them, they're dead. I go up to the area to see where it was, just to see if it was being kept up, and it was only a short distance from there. And It got me thinking, you know, you think, these two will be brought up together at that spot to raise out of the earth. They're not going to care what their tombstone looked like. They're not caring right now. You look at these individuals of men in faith through the years, and there's a lot. I'm not going to list them all. I usually try to think of the ones in the past year that have died. But there's so many of those individuals we're excited to see again. We think of those who have, throughout Hebrews 11, you know, the Stephens, the, the Pauls, the Davids, the Daniels, the Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and I look forward to seeing their parents and not being around too close when they say they change their names to pagan names. But their parents who will likely be at that seventh trump. Do you picture yourself there? Do you get excited? The goosebumps there. Yeah, we look forward to tabernacle, Feast of Tabernacles on the last great day. Wonderful meetings. But this is the day where true victory is to the saints. And we will serve through those future times. And we can hardly wait to see those in the last great day that we brought up to teach and to have other extended family. But if you're not here on this day in victory, you'll be there. When you hear the seventh trump, my first thought will probably be to pinch myself. Does it hurt or not? And my spirit being, will it be that quick to the twinkling of an eye? Because if I'm physical at that seventh trump, what have I been doing? I hope I'm not going to be physical at that seventh trump. We want to be on the side of victory. That reminder of what God's plan is for us. To be thinking about those individuals that we long to see. As you think about it, them sitting, standing, floating. We're going to be able to fly at that point. Singing this song before God's throne. And why I love these verses because, yeah, we can get caught up in, ah, oh, I've gone through this trial and that trial. God cares for us, but who's going to bring you through it? But I love as you think about these verses in verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous am I in all that I've gone through. Nope, hopefully not what your Bible says. We'll look at especially atonement. We think of an attitude God's looking at, humility. We are to fast on the day of atonement, but it should go beyond just doing without food and water. It's an attitude of humility. It's not about us. But, boy... It'll be wonderful to be on the side of victory. All through the years, people that, oh, you keep the Sabbath, you keep the Old, Old Testament days, those Jewish days. Yes, that's the side of victory. God's ways, they're precious. They're, it can hardly wait to have them fulfilled. But this world spits and tramples on them and makes you think that you are a loser for keeping them. True victory comes from following all of God's laws. Let's get to what the verse actually says now, sorry. Great and marvelous are your works, capital Y, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. So many of these, as you start to go through, we look at devastations that have happened, people getting cancer, going, well, that's not a just God. No, it's not. We are in Satan's world. Why we don't jump from trumpets to the Feast of Tabernacles. Day of Atonement, someone has to be shackled. Someone has to be thrown into the bottomless pit because of his deceptions, his antics, the making you think thoughts of, oh yeah, God's not always fair all the time. God is always perfectly fair. We live in a world that has chosen Satan's ways. They chose, they continue to choose not to repent and turn to God. 
So God stands back, well, I can let more hurricanes hit you. These are Satan's ways. These are what Satan's doing. This is Satan's world. He wants to kill everyone. God says, I can stand back. These words in the song that are to be sung are ones that do we think about. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Makes you think of back to Mount Sinai. There should have been trembling, even from the Caleb, Joshua, Moses that were around it. But it was a healthy fear. Look at the God we're serving. He makes his ground just shake and his voice boom. Look at his power. I'm nothing without him. I want to be close to God. That's the one I've got to be by. And we think about this, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. Why, he alone makes the Sabbath holy. Why he alone makes a holy convocation. And why we put thought into it. I mention it all the time. Why I wear a suit. I do not wear a suit to impress anyone in this room. I wear my very best to come before the ruler of the universe who called this holy convocation. And we have the privilege to be here before him. You think of coming before dignitaries. None of them deserve anything compared to what our Father deserves, who called this and where I want to wear my very best before Him. You alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, and your for your judgments have been manifest. The feast of trumpets, judgment will come on this earth. It will be perfectly justified it will be exactly what god shows is needed on an unrepentant world and it's still with mercy it's not as this world thinks that oh they're going to burn in hell for all eternity they'll be brought up at the second resurrection and we'll go through that on the last great day and what their part that they can then learn god's ways and repent and be a part of God's family like every single one of us. God's plan is for all of mankind. And this Feast of Trumpets is one that reminds us to keep watching, to keep overcoming. So many verses that we think of, <clears throat> sermons on themselves on watching. A couple that I'll give you just to put in your notes for lack of time. Luke chapter 21. Luke 21 verses 34 through 38. We're reminded over and over to watch. It's a great word study. Look up everywhere. Watch comes up. Watching. Sometimes we can get stuck on world events, which is part of watching. Watching even more so is watching our lives. Seeing where we are doing, how we're doing. Are we overcoming? Turn over here to Revelation 21. <clears throat> this being... After New Jerusalem comes down, the new heaven and new earth. And this same concept and reminder to overcome, the same reminder we have to today, Revelation 21, verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. You think of, again, translation, victory shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is the same promise that will take place after the last great day for all to be in God's family. The same one we have now. Verse 8, <clears throat> it doesn't end there. But the cowardly, this word is fearful. How fearful have we been in the six months? I'm not belittling it at all. It's been tough at times. I hated that we had to that I had to cancel services for some weeks. And it's taken us a while to get back. And even now, we're six feet apart. And it's starting to get back to normal, but we still have a ways to go if we get back to it. My prayer is we speed up into end-time events and let's get to the trumps. God's will be done. We think of this reminder, but the cowardly. <clears throat> are we fearful 
Does fear run our life? The cowardly, unbelieving faith is no longer there. Well, God promises this, but I, I can't really believe him. I don't think he'd really protect me through this Feast of Tabernacles. I don't think he could possibly, you fill in the blank, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. I think liars is in the same list as murderers. Surely not that bad. You can tell white lies. It's not that important. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's that lake of fire. Those that do not repent. Doesn't mean that we weren't this way and we came out of this way of life. It means those who continue to go down this path of being cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. This way of life is the world's way of life. We're to overcome and come out of it, to turn to God, to what victory really is. Lake of fire is the ultimate in defeat. Choosing to follow God and live by his ways, we see true victory on this feast of trumpets. To stay close to God, prayer, Bible study, fasting, meditation, humble, and stay close to God. Micah 6, 8, one of my favorite verses, hopefully a memory verse you can put in your notes, Micah 6, 8, what God expects We'll look at some of this as we either next Sabbath or on atonement. And that attitude of humility, how quickly pride puffs us up. How quickly, well, I'm going to be there at the seventh trump. Will you? Not on your own you won't. Only if you're staying close to God. Are we staying close? Peter's last letters are some of my favorites as well because he knew how he was going to die. And yet he kept looking to the future. Put these in your notes as well. 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 18. 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 18. It is filled with hope, reminder of what our future holds. Comes back to what we've been looking at through the whole sermon of victory, overcoming with God's help. And now I love these verses that again remind us in Revelation. And that song Singing of God's might and power. It's not our might and power. It's God. And to be in his family at that point, at that seventh trump, what a joyful occasion. What a longing that we can hardly wait for. We long for this day to be fulfilled in God's perfect plan. The Feast of Trumpets is a time of rejoicing and knowing what future awaits. To those that follow God, what a wonderful future, victory. To those that will not follow, there is defeat. Where are you at? God sets before each and every one of us life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Let's be sure that we are continuing to overcome and strengthen that relationship with God. Looking forward to the remainder of the fall festivals as they keep progressing through God's perfect plan. What an inheritance that awaits if we continue to endure. Let's continue to prepare for this wonderful day to be fulfilled when there will be victory. Continue to be on the side of victory.